Today we're going to be checking out uh, one of my most popular uploads from last year, which is the Polaris video from the Fantasy, and just going over some of the stuff that took place in that mix, but also looking at some things that I would do differently if I was mixing it today. Just going to go ahead and play the full mixed instruments um, with the vocals muted, just so you can kind of hear how this set sounds just instrumentally uh, with everything that I did on the mix back then. All right, so first we'll just take a listen to the drums uh, without any bass, no guitar, no backing tracks, no 808s. So the kick, straight in. I already hear something about my old mix that I'm not too crazy about. I'm going to take this off as well. So here's the raw kick signal. So you can hear it, and I know that it's inside the kick. I can tell just, like, I know what that mic sounds like, and it picks up a lot of snare. So the, what I hear when I listen to my mix that I did of it at the time is that I should have gated the kick a little quicker i hear a lot of extra resonance after every kick hit on my mix and uh, i'm just going to go over how i did it then and what i'm going to do a little differently right now so i'm using the waves renaissance channel which is a gate and then an eq and then a compressor all in one so it's essentially an req4 and a renaissance compressor and then they just have this extra expander slash gate that you can use so i'm going to bring this plugin in during this kick loop here and then we'll make some adjustments to tighten it up even more than i had at the time so what I could have done better is I could have used the side chain on the gate here. Uh, what that does is makes the gate a little bit pickier about when it opens up. So you can choose what frequencies actually open up the gate. And what I'm going to do is take out the top end stuff. So when you initialize it, you see on your EQ here, this stuff that's in the blue is what opens up the gate. And you can listen to what you're adjusting by clicking this button here. So without this on, essentially everything opens the gate. If I move it down like this, the snare isn't going to open up the gate as much. So without... Now, that's not doing a lot because the gate... Uh, it's actually an expander. It's not very picky. What I need to do is make it a little tighter and um, not allow as much through. It's kind of letting this low rumble ring out afterwards, which is actually not really coming from the kick. It's just like everything, all the low end on stage. So I want to tighten it up a little bit more. And my low end boost here, I'm just going to narrow the band on my low end boost a little bit. And take a better listen to what I cut out of the mid range. I feel like I could have done that a little better as well. As far as the compressor goes, pretty standard for what I do. Uh, I'm going to make the release a little faster and the attack a little slower, just so that it's a little bit punchier. So 
So now we listen to the original kick and what I just did. And it looks like I have an additional EQ on here. Adding a little bit more low end and a little bit more top end. Actually, the most significant thing about this EQ, from what I'm hearing, is this cut here, uh, 2.34K. It's just making the kick a little less papery sounding. Uh, the, look, the attack of the kick is getting a little bit more defined just by taking out the mid range that isn't quite where I want it to be. But I actually am gonna bring that back a little bit. It's a bit much. On top of that, uh, CLA 76 compressor with an eight to one ratio, kind of in the middle with the attack. It's not too slow, which would be one. It's not too fast, which would be seven. I feel like I'm compressing it a little too hard, so I'm gonna back that off a little bit. So just those few little changes with, you know, a lot of time to improve on what I listen for in my mixes, I feel like this kick already sounds punchier than what I had before. Uh, I'm going to listen to the toms real quick. I feel like the toms actually sounded really good on my original mix here. Uh, try to find a spot where all the toms get used. This fill right here. So for the tom one. I'm not really gating it. I'm just kind of doing an expander. And as you can see, I did side chain it like we did to the kick. Nothing over 2K is really gonna trigger the gate to open. You can listen to that by uh, hitting the speaker here. So what we're hearing right now is what frequencies are opening the gate. So I'm kind of trying to take the crash symbol out as much of the snare as I can. You kind of know on a tom that the low mid is going to be one of the heaviest, most powerful parts of the instrument. So if you can focus your gate to be open by that, uh, you'll get less bleed. And the reason I don't hard gate it is because you don't want it to sound drastic in a recording of a live environment. You can get away with harder gating in the studio, but I try to stick to light expansion with live because uh, if it if it's hard off the whole time and then when a tom hit comes in, you're going to hear a drastic increase in cymbal volume and it's just not as smooth to listen to. So this is just a little easier on the ears. I keep my ratios very low, like 1.1, 1.5 at the most. So you're still hearing the cymbal when it's below the orange line here, below the threshold, um, but it's not like a hard off and on. Here's what it sounds like without this gate. So it's a difference, but it's not drastic. And then for the EQ on the tom, the tom sounded great already. So it's just a little bit of a boost with a little bit of a cut and then a little bit of a boost again. So obviously, big cut here. This is the frequency that I'm taking out. And I like this EQ because I can't get too surgical with it. Toms are really good with this EQ because you kind of just want to make the attack come up a bit more without taking too much of the mid range away because if you scoop it too hard, your toms aren't gonna cut through your guitars at all. So the fact that you can't really do too much works in your favor because the more you start processing a tom with extra EQs and cutting all these weird overtones out, it doesn't really sound like the tom anymore. It just sounds like an electronic drum, essentially, if you just cut everything out. So it's easy to make it sound really punchy 
um, if you want to just go overboard with your EQ, but in my opinion, drums that are tuned well sound really good straight in, so you might as well just keep your EQ moves to be as little as possible. I kind of just took the same approach with all the toms here. I could move this up if I wanted to. But even still, without it, So I'm taking some of the stuff out behind the toms, but it's more so important for the spots between songs. I don't have to hear the vocal coming through the monitors ringing out in my tom mics. So that's really where this is most important to me. It, it does help to tame the cymbals a little bit, and you could always add an EQ at the end if like your tom boost was just making the cymbals way too harsh. So uh, same deal, nothing too crazy on the EQ. I took out the low end rumble, everything below 60. And then I just found where the attacks sit nicely. So I'm not really changing the characteristics of the Tom itself. It still sounds how it did before. It just sounds a little more present. Um, finding where the resonance sits well, because Sometimes you want to feel those larger toms come through your mix and then just finding where I want the attack to sit. This could be lower or higher depending on how you mix your guitars. Uh, and Tom 3, same deal. A little bit of expansion. Now what I am noticing is there's still a lot of low end rumbling out in there. So if I wanted to, I could get a little pickier. And as I increase the ratio here, I could lower the range. So there's still going to be a little bit of resonance underneath, but when you take it all out, um, out of solo that is, and listen to all the toms together, the gating's not too bad. And then on top of that, um, EQing through the SSL channel, let's listen to just that tom. So mainly just bringing out the attack and not really messing too much with the overall characteristics of the tom. That's generally how I'm going to describe how I mix my toms is I want it to sound close to how it's sounded going in, just fitting it in my mix a little better. And outside of a kick drum, that's kind of my approach to mixing drums. Obviously a kick you need to go a little bit further, kind of exaggerate the attack and the low end depending on how you mic'd it up. But uh, as a drummer myself and someone who's kind of a purist about keeping things as close to how they sounded going in and just making them sound like a better versions of themselves rather than trying to change the tonality and the characteristics of the instrument completely, I less is more when it comes to certain things. And I would say toms and usually snares is one of them. So speaking of the snare... Just take a listen to how that snare sounded going straight in. We'll just go on a normal beat here where the snare is kind of getting hit about as hard as it gets hit for most of the set. So obviously I wish I had a snare bottom mic, but I don't. Um, but you can still do a lot with the snare. And from what I remember of my original mix of this, the snare could have been even more present. So the first thing I did, take a look here. Uh, standard stuff for me, SSL channel, boosting high mids, top end, because I don't have a snare bottom. This is going to be a little bit more than a normal snare top. Cutting out overtones down here. Uh, got it at 
830 hertz and then there's usually a big bump around 200 hertz uh, especially in metal metal core when it comes to mixing the snares I'm actually going to exaggerate these boosts even more. And we got that going into a DBX160 compressor. I feel like I suffocated it a little too much in the original mix. So what I'm gonna do is back off the compression ratio Like I said, less is more. So uh, just reducing the compressor a little bit makes the cymbal bleed reduced and also makes the snare still have a little bit more of its dynamics and its attack that it should have. So I would say I over compress the snare a little bit on the original mix. And then usually this last compressor is just to prevent any over the top peaks from clipping. So a hit like that, you could see it's hitting around minus four rather than clipping my mix. So that's just kind of like clip protection, whatever you want to call it. And then I have the kick and the snare going to a combined parallel compression bus. Um, I typically use the CLA-76 for parallel compression, so it's no surprise to see my typical settings of the fastest attack, the fastest release, and a high ratio, like 12, 20, or all. So with or without that, um, you'll hear a little bit more presence in the snare and just a little bit more punch out of the kick. Keep in mind now that I'm gating the kick a little bit more, there won't be as much bleed coming into this channel. My toms don't have a parallel compression, but the kick and the snare are getting a lot of help from this channel. And you can always add it in a little bit less to the amount that I did. You just kind of find where it works for you. But parallel compression is a really good way to keep yourself from over EQing your kick and your snare. Sometimes it just needs a lot more saturation from a parallel compression bus. And um, a little bit goes a long way with parallel compression, I would say. What I did with the toms is actually I just sent all three toms to a bus and put a compressor on it. And I feel like I don't use this compressor that much, so it's a little weird to see that this is the one I chose at the time, but we'll take it off and put it on and see how it sounds. So what I would do now I'm going to bypass it. I'm not going to delete it because I'd still like to be able to go back and mess with this session some more one day. Um, I feel like I would rather just use something that's not as like coloring, changing the characteristics of the toms, just something that's a little bit more of like keeping the attack in check and making sure it doesn't clip. Um, we'll do all this fastest release possible and we'll turn on manual makeup because sometimes like auto makeup gain correction kind of messes with my mix too much So it's not a lot, but it does kind of bring the toms more up front. So aggressive drums is always a good foundation to set for mixing a band of this style. And obviously, like I said, when you're mixing studio stuff, you can kind of get a little bit more extreme with your processing. 
I try to avoid too much bleed from all the compression and whatnot. So uh, as much as I can get away with without overdoing it. So here's what the drums sound like now with those few adjustments. So in my opinion, that sounds better than how I had it on the original. Um, so that's part one of this. Uh, tomorrow, I will go through the rest of the mix. Um, obviously, anyone who's seen the video knows that one of the guitar tracks was pre-recorded. We'll talk a little bit about that and whether or not it makes or breaks the mix. Uh, in my opinion, it really doesn't. But we'll talk about that. Overall, how I mix the bass and uh, everything else that's part of this mix. Obviously, you'll get to hear the vocals raw and unmixed and then how I process them. And we'll take a little bit more of a look at things that I would have done differently now and we will apply them. So uh, keep an eye out for part two of this behind the mix video. We will cover the rest of the Polaris mix.